This is the Impunity Observer podcast. Fergus Hodgson here, publisher of the Impunity Observer. Really excited to be able to do the podcast this month. We have a, an incredible guest, Mark Moyer, and he is the author of Masters of Corruption, How the Federal Bureaucracy Sabotaged the Trump Presidency. He was a, a political appointee in the Trump administration, uh, working with civilian military affairs. And now he's a history professor at Hillsdale College, which is a famous college that accepts no federal funding and is one of the most, let's say, bastions of intellectual rigor in the United States. So wonderful to have you, Mark. Welcome. And please tell us, does you know what can your book add to the, the to the discussion? Does everyone just know that Trump was sabotaged, or is this lost on people? Well, it depends who you ask. Certainly, some of his supporters know about the things that were done to him. I mean, it started even before he was elected with this crossfire hurricane scandal where the FBI doctors documents to initiate spying on Trump. And eventually a bunch of these FBI people get fired. Now, if you ask liberals in the United States, a lot of them won't even know what a crossfire hurricane is, which is a sad reflection on our media, which tends to, to hide stuff like this. My book is at a bit of a different level. It's looking down in the federal agencies because you can't you don't run the government from the White House, the day to day operations, it, it's the agencies where things actually are executed. And so my book is really about those within the agencies, how it was that the bureaucrats very often prevailed over the political appointees who were supposed to be running the show. Is it really a partisan problem? That I mean, we all know that something like ninety percent plus of the federal workers are registered Democrats. So does that mean only when Republicans are in office and, and the executive that they face this sabotage? It is certainly a bigger problem for Republican administrations for the reason that you say that these bureaucrats, you know, in the twenty sixteen election, ninety five percent of contributions from federal employees went to Hillary Clinton. Now some of these bureaucrats know that their job is to follow orders, but some of them clearly, and I saw this, uh, think that they are more enlightened than the people who were elected and therefore they can push their policies. Now, when the Democrats in charge, the career bureaucrats tend to be more uh, in line, although we have seen uh, in, in recent times on the question of Gaza, for example, some of the bureaucrats have wanted to move further to the left than Biden, but by and large, they've been more willing to go along. Now, some of the problems of corruption and uh, power seeking those do span multiple organizations because there are uh, some people who are simply in this for personal power and gain. And so even the Democrats may get in their way. Was there a particular moment in U.S. history where this divergence happened or has it just always been there? Well, it's gotten a lot worse in, since the beginning of the 20th century. But that's when you had the, the advent of the income tax and the government suddenly became much, much larger. It went from I think, half a million to uh, four million over the course of the century. So you have much bigger government, more opportunities for graft and corruption and insubordination. Now, we have seen problems you know, from the very beginning of the American Republic and people themselves are you know, flawed individuals, but you know, we've tried historically, we've tried to cultivate a sense of virtue in our people to try to, to limit the impact of these problems. And that's one of the problems I think we've seen with the secularization in much of American society that we no longer have a sort of common understanding of, of right and wrong and, and why people should be looking out for the public welfare and not just for themselves. Yes. Look, I know you're an academic and I, one of my own personal pet peeves is the way that plagiarism and cheating are just have just overrun higher education. And now we're finding out, of course, that even the top professors and even presidents of universities have gotten in on the action. So you're right that the sense of some sort of moral decency, like you said, there maybe isn't a coherent understanding or unified understanding in the United States of that anymore. So, but in the case of the Donald Trump era or his tenure, which may be renewed, this was a unique situation where he was basically vilified by both, both Democrat and Republican beltway people. 
So presumably that meant that almost 100% of the people in working were against him. Some groups, uh, particularly in, in the national security world, the Defense Department, who in general lean right, and they, you know, initially it, the whole DC establishment was against Trump on the Republican side. But once he won the nomination, a lot of people gravitated towards him, if uh, in some cases, simply because he was better than Hillary Clinton. I mean, Hillary Clinton represents. Uh, big state liberalism, very active interventionist government. And so I think a lot of Americans, myself included, recognized that uh, she was she posed a threat and she was going to further advance what Obama had been doing, which we didn't like. And so Trump has eventually succeeded in winning over most of the Republican Party. And we can see that now in the current state where the polls are roughly even between him and uh, Kamala Harris. OK, there's so much I want to unpack here because you have witnessed a lot of this activity firsthand. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the structure of your book so we can we can maybe attack the, its most important elements? Yeah, so I start off a, a little bit uh, just of background on, on education and the things I learned growing up and in college. Talk about a few authors that were really influential. Aristotle, Dostoevsky, probably the two foremost in, in thinking about moral decisions. And to talk a little bit about how higher education has been politicized in this country so that there's almost no conservatives left uh, in Harvard, where I went, there's only 1% of the faculty now identify as conservative. Uh, and then I get into the, my time in the Trump administration, and there is a, you know, sort of a somewhat of a side story, but that underlies what comes, which is that I had submitted a book for review by the government because I'd worked at the Defense Department. So I had to sign this non-disclosure agreement, uh, which gave them 30 days to review it. And then they took much longer. You know, they had over a year to review it. They don't review it. And so, uh, but that that all disappears. And then suddenly two years later, uh, as I get into the book, I find corruption involving my own deputy and report that. And then suddenly this pretext- Hold on, is, deputy is the person working under you or above you? Uh, under me. Um, there were several people I reported for corruption, but the most serious was my deputy. So he was immediately uh, beneath me. And so he was involved in a criminal conflict of interest, which is perhaps the most common form of corruption in the United States now, where you have people in the government colluding with people who are getting money from the government to steer contracts or grants their way. And so he eventually got forced out, although in something that uh, you know, you think maybe doesn't happen so much in the United States, he actually evades punishment by moving to another part of the federal government, and so he's still working there. So if you talk about impunity, that's uh, <laughs> that's what we're talking yeah. about here. And meanwhile, I got ended up getting fired over this ridiculous <laughs> accusation. Sorry, this is the challenge. Sorry, you have to laugh to keep from crying because I feel for you, mate. So you're in this role. But the the corruption you're talking about there, mentioning, let's say, just people uh, profiteering, that is separate from policy corruption or people just undoing what the Americans have, what American voters have supported, right, or a signal they want. Yes, and I and there is definitely some of that I covered too. I mean, I talk, for example, about how there was discussion that I happened to hear about how the agency wanted to keep providing humanitarian funds to Syria, and they didn't think Trump would like it, so they were going to try to conceal that aid. Uh, and I, I reported that up through the senior political leadership, and apparently nothing was done, which again, this is part of the problem. We had some of our own political appointees were not willing to stand up to these bureaucrats because they were afraid of them or they... You know, one of the common things that happens too is that people can get promised future employment if they kind of go along. You know, once you leave, you know, I'll, I'll find you a good job at one of our contractors. And so there were a lot of appointees, I wouldn't say a lot, but some, and, and I chronicle them a book, who basically went along with the criminality of the bureaucracy because they didn't want to create enemies or or they they had some sort of enticements to do so. Okay. Now 
I'm not sure whether you're familiar with this gentleman, but Daniel Rund, or Rundi, I'm not sure how you pronounce his last name, has written The American Imperative. Okay, it's a book. Uh, the subtitle is Recl Reclaiming Global Leadership Through Soft Power. And he is chief executive or president of CSIS. And he uh, describes himself as a conservative. I read the book and it did not promote any, let's say, scaling back of U.S. interventionism abroad. You know, it, wasn't, it wasn't a proposal to have, let's say, a Monroe Doctrine again. Uh, now, that, and that led me to believe that even the conservatives or free market types in this sphere you entered would have been maybe hostile to someone like you who was more independent. Do you want to clarify, because are these just Republican Party hacks who get selected for these political positions? You had a big split in the conservative movement in 2016, particularly in the area of foreign policy. So I, at the time, was working at a think tank. And we had several people who signed a petition that was circulated uh, by a couple of um, neocons that was basically denouncing Trump. And I did not sign that, but a lot of the sort of Beltway insiders in the national security world did. And so they basically ruled themselves out of service for, in the Trump administration. Uh, but you have uh, then, and certainly now too, you have wings of the Republican Party that are more internationalist and those that are um, more, could say, isolationist or... Um, Non-interventionist, paleoconservative. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, uh, and that's an ongoing debate. I mean, you see it over what's going on in um, Middle East and Ukraine right now. The Republican Party is divided. You know, I think there is, but the Republicans have not been good, very good at sort of rallying around a common theme. I do think Ultimately, the, the political right tends to unite around the idea that what America does should be done in the country's national interest, whereas the left is uh, oftentimes is, is more concerned about global interests than American interests. Um, but but this certainly has been a point of division. Uh, but I do think you know, Trump's been reasonably successful in trying to hold the coalition together. And I said the alternative, the left is, is so unpalatable that uh, that he's able to do that. Yeah, well, because the challenge with progressives is that not only do they want to be interventionists, but a lot of their intervention would be unpalatable to the American populace, right? So going around and, and promoting, let's say the, I don't know, gender, uh, ag the agenda of LGBTQ groups in conservative countries where it just seems like it's way beyond the scope of foreign policy. Now, Okay, we've we've faced this problem in Central America, and it, often it's it's very hard to believe where U.S. State Department officials working in Central America, especially Guatemala, will be overtly progressive or leftist. And in fact, I think this was back in the '90s. There was a, a paper leaked from the U.S. Embassy that was basically chastising a free market or libertarian university in Guatemala, you might know, but Universidad Francisco Marroquin. And it was, it was, it was like a satirical article because they were basically saying all the true things about it. And everyone's going, yeah, you know, the, the, this is not a secret. They're, they're pro-capitalism, right? Anyway, so fundamentally, we seem to have accumulated an anti-American foreign policy establishment within the State Department. Now, does that go for other branches of government or is, is it particularly the case in that branch? And now you so see it, call it in, I, to be technical, I shouldn't call it branch, but in, in that department. Yeah. Yes. Well, USAID, which is separate from state, has we have similar problems there. And there's actually an interesting division on the left side. Some of them are actually fairly are people of faith, some of whom were descended from missionaries, for example, but they have to sort of hide in the closet because religion uh, within the agency is sort is is very unpopular because of LGBTQ issues and abortion, uh, and so the prevailing sort of orthodoxy is that um, religion is bad, and we need to promote LGBTQ issues. And under Obama, we saw, and in fact, I wrote a Wall Street Journal article about um, 
a case, I think it was actually in Guatemala, of uh, USAID had a program that was teaching policemen how to deal with people whose uh, gender on their ID didn't seem to match their face. And um, so now when Trump came in, try to get rid of that stuff. But what I also saw, and we, uh, I think we're not sufficiently vigorous in dealing with, is that the bureaucrats would find ways to uh, keep all of these programs, but simply slap some other label on them. So, uh, you know, our, our head said, we're going to do self, we want to focus on self-reliance now for, with our aid programs. So they'd, so they'd say, well, yeah, we're going to keep doing this, um, you know, gender program because it's actually helping them become self-reliant because only when they have, you know, full appreciation of, of queer gender theory, can they truly be independent? So one of the challenges though, is as you said, they seem to be rather adept at evading any kind of accountability. So let's say we identify USAID officials in Guatemala who are promoting access to abortion or you know whatever it may be. How does anyone ever get fired for that sort of thing? Part of the problem too is that the foreign service officers who are doing most of this work, they have a union that, and so it's very hard to fire any of them. And uh, it's sort of like our teachers here too. And so <laughs> usually the worst thing that happens is they might get reassigned. So that, that's one of the things that Trump is talking about doing for a second term would be to change the rules so you can actually go after these people. And I mean, that's a problem government wide. You know, our veteran system is notorious for this, where the, the health care that's supposed to be provided for veterans is often screwed up because they have all these incompetent officials and no one seems to be able to get get rid of these folks. Yeah. Now, the, the question which I assume you've been asked many times, given the release of your book, is, is this just going to happen all over again? I think it's going to be better if Trump gets reelected because he has learned the lesson from the last time. Last time they were very unprepared to put personnel in. So that's why you had people like Rex Tillerson that very hastily assembled personnel. And a lot of them, you know, as I talk about in the book, were not really interested in getting things done. So it wasn't until his fourth year of, in office, really, that they actually got rid of a lot of these people and started bringing in others. So now they've had Trump uh, and also some outside organizations that are making recommendations have come up with lists of people who uh, are going to fill these positions right away and, and get things moving. So it's going to be better. I mean, there's still going to be a lot of resistance from, you know, what we're now calling lawfare. All these lawsuits get filed to try to obstruct what he wants to do. And the media, you know, by and large, uh, has been resistant to most of the things Trump's tried to do. And, and as we've seen just in the recent campaigning there, the, most of the media is, you know, hard to distinguish from the Democratic Party. It, it has become that way as it, it's it's one of those tragedies of almost almost mirroring or par parallel to the higher education system that the more that conservatives give up on conventional media or conventional education, the more it gets worse, right? It's just like, oh, you leave it now, it's, it's worse than it was before. So, and just personally, I know that even most of the staffers of Fox News in Washington, DC tend to be more Democrat leaning, even though their job is to serve the, the conservative base of America, whatever it may be. So it is a serious challenge. And that's why alternative media is so important. Of course, I believe in it and assist with this. Now, maybe this is a, a third rail topic. You don't have to address it if you don't want to, but how familiar are you with this Project 2025 project? You know, I am what, familiar what with this. Yes. You yeah. know, I have, I've not been uh, you know, directly involved in it, but um, you know, that's one of the places that has been working on coming up with people to recommend for the new uh, administration and, you know, it did get shut down because it was getting all this negative publicity and Trump has distanced himself from it. Uh, but they do have a lot of good ideas. I mean, they had a 900 page report and uh, but there's others producing reports like this, too, that are making recommendations. And uh, so in, in general, I think it's been a positive for, for the administration. Did, did I hear you correctly? Project 2025 is completely shut down now. The Heritage Foundation or whoever was running it is just. The, the, yeah, they the head of it stepped down recently. And um, I think they're still doing a few things, but I think they've kind of 
said that they they finished these these planning documents and they've come up with extensive personnel database lists and they're going to kind of offer those to the Trump campaign. But the Trump campaign is you know free to take as much or or, or as little of that as possible. Yeah. So it just seems that it was too politically radioactive that somehow progressive media or legacy media just vilified it sufficiently that no one wanted to touch it anymore. Yeah. And, you know, it was, a, I think, pretty coordinated uh, effort. And, and this is something we've seen um, with other things involving this current campaign. I mean, if you look at uh, Kamala Harris, I mean, that's one of her big, been one of her big talking points in, in her her proxies. And then uh, this idea of joy that that word gets thrown as somehow this this idea that she is full of joy is somehow suffused all of the mainstream media, which is kind of ridiculous for anybody who's paid much attention to her. It's a it's a vacuous slogan, to be frank. Yeah. I wonder how anyone can get away with that. So but the idea to me when I heard of this project was that it made perfect sense that you you have the American voters putting in someone who is against a lot of what the for the, the the quote deep state or the permanent bureaucracy is up to, and they resist. So you need some kind of independent party or third party to really help provide the manpower to make the get this through to serve the American people. But so I don't know why this is such a bad thing. I feel like they're just trying to help the American voters. One of the most controversial things, which is uh, gets to the point you're talking about, is what they called Schedule F, which essentially says. Uh, Right now, there is, say, roughly 4 million people in the federal workforce. There's only 4,000 political appointees, the 1,000 to 1 ratio. Uh, they've said, well, you know, we need more political appointees. And so we're going to do that, we'll get rid of some career people and in increase that number from 4,000. Uh, some have said to 10,000. Some, you know, said, oh, we could do 50,000. I mean, no one said we're going to replace the large majority of people. But, you know, the, the Democrats you know, tend to be much bigger supporters of the bureaucracy and they know the bureaucracy is on their side. So they've spread all this, uh, you know, terrible news that, you know, instead of uh, you know, certain people being career bureaucrats who we know, of course, career bureaucrats are saintly that, that we're going to have these terrible Trump appointees coming in. But uh, it does, I think, make sense when you have such a vast bureaucracy that you would want some additional political appointees there to, uh, especially in, in terms of what we've seen of bureaucratic resistance. As a disruptive force. Now, that's what I was, I was, you know, naturally, another question from your book would be, okay, so we, well, who we elect doesn't seem to matter that much, right? It's almost as though whoever gets in there, that you know, there's this machine that's just marching on and it's hard to disrupt. Does that mean we need to have more Project 2025s or we need to somehow build more Hillsdale colleges or, you know, what's, what, what is your takeaway for the reader? Yeah, well, there's several things. You know, one thing that needs to be overhauled is the inspector general system. Because in my own case, uh, these are the, supposed to be the people who safeguard integrity and, and stop waste, fraud and abuse. Um, in my case, after I was fired, I went to them to submit a whistleblower retaliation claim, and they actually tried to come up with every possible excuse in the book as to why I was not a whistleblower. And it's, uh, and, and, you know, I'm sure you're familiar, you know, with it's it's somewhat similar to these bodies that have been set up in, in various countries of Latin America to fight impunity. But if they're under the control of the wrong people, they just become part of the problem. So we've had that that problem we need to clean house with these inspectors general and sort of detach them right now they're actually sort of beholden to the people they're watching that's one of the big things um you know getting the right people in to run these agencies uh is a big part of the solution and but more broadly too i talk about how we need to you know revitalize our sense of public ethics because we, you know, historically until fairly recently have had a fairly cohesive culture with a sort of common national narrative, um, you know, starting with George Washington. And the left has tried to sort of eviscerate that and uh, portray this as all as the work of dead white males. And instead, we should um, you know, read multiculturalist works and, and people like Ibram Kennedy and these uh, critical race theorists, which has been highly destructive. You know, of our culture. And so that's why Hillsdale 
and institutions like it are so important because we have we are pushing back on that and we are still trying to maintain that traditional uh, ethical core that has helped make the country so strong in the past. Okay, Mark, you've been very generous with your time. So his website is Mark Moyer. Now that's M-O-Y-A-R, markmoyer.com. And the book is Masters of Corruption, How the Federal Bureaucracy Sabotaged the Trump Presidency. And to be frank, I could, you know, chew at this topic for a long time. So I'd love to, uh, I'm really glad you've addressed this and I encourage people to check it out. I will, it's got an audio version, so I'll do that soon after this. So thanks for your time and best of luck with sales. Great. Thanks for having me.